Hi everyone, today I'm going to make you a small presentation of Erasmus+. Plus. Let's start with the history of the program. Uh, the history of the program actually starts in the 60s with the student uh, Sofia Corradi. She was actually studying in another country than Italy and when she had uh, to come back to Italy she realized she had to start all over again her studies because nothing was recognized in Italy. So after getting an actual job so she put this into European agenda, but this program actually started to be a reality in the year 1986 with the president of IG going to see the president of France, François Mitterrand, and, uh, and he proposed him to give a better image to the European Commission and to European Union through allowing student exchange throughout Europe. Actually, it was a time when everything was going fast, faster than today. So in the year 1987, it actually started the program Erasmus with uh, a budget of 85 million EQ. It was the European currency unit. It was before Euro, the, the ancestor. And uh, so it's equivalent to 85 million of euros today. And uh, it started, this 85 million euros were for two years of the program. Then it was like extended to more years. And uh, it was really focused on exchange of students at this time. In year 2007, Erasmus, this Erasmus was integrated a bigger and more ambitious program named Lifelong Learning, who had, uh, this program had uh, 1 billion euros of budget per year and uh, it was opening this uh, this exchanges not only to students but also to teachers of university to students of high school and secondary school also to exchange between association under the frame of use exchanges and trainings and uh, also it was appearing the uh, European uh, volunteering service and also exchanging between companies and uh, in Europe and between the public institutions. In year 2014, this lifelong learning program was finished and a new program appeared. It's Erasmus Plus. So Erasmus Plus is really gathering all the international mobility programs of uh, education, uh, non-formal and formal education. And uh, it has a budget of 2 billion euros per year. It will go until 2020, until a new program appear and emerge. So let me explain you now, how is it working? So Erasmus Plus is very complex and uh, it includes a lot of different kind of mobilities. Uh, we will focus mostly on mobilities linked with uh, non-formal education and youth. Under non-formal education and youth, uh, the the budget of Erasmus Plus comes from the European Commission and is like distributed between uh, national agencies throughout European Union, but not only, because also uh, Turkey, for example, Iceland, uh, Republic of North Macedonia are member of the Erasmus Plus program. It means they participate to the budget, so they have the right also to have a national agency. And each national agency is distributing this money and managing this money uh, on its own territory. Uh, so as you can see like the member countries of Erasmus Plus are even more than uh, than the European Union itself and these countries uh, in these countries associations, companies, public institutions are allowed to to have some budgets to organize uh, mobilities. The program has also partner countries like Russia, Caucasus country, Mediterranean countries and many others who are not allowed to submit projects directly because they don't have national agency. They can actually submit some kind of projects, but most of the projects they are not allowed to submit. They can submit some projects directly to Brussels, but they can be partner for projects. So it means uh, I organize a project in France with my association. I can invite Georgia, I can inv invite Algeria, and they can join the project, but they will not be able to receive uh, the grant. So, the, basically, uh, the national agencies are uh, proposing call for projects 
uh, it's happen it's happening during the year every year and uh, this call for projects are dedicated to different kind of actions different kind of activities uh, we'll focus on two activities because for example volunteering European volunteering service I am not definitely not an expert about it so I don't want to say anything wrong let's start with youth exchanges uh, the goal of youth exchanges is to allow young people in Europe to meet each other, exchange and live sometimes together. It's, it's between 5 and 21 days and um, excluded the travel days, of course. And uh, this kind of exchange had, has to include 16 to 60 participants. Participants need to be between 13 years old and 30 years old. Each group should include a team leader who should be minimum 18 years old. Usually these projects either uh, include only um, underage people like 13 to 18 or only 18 to 30. Sometimes I have seen also projects where the organizer asks people to be between 18 and 25. But technically, legally, it can include young people from 13 to 30 years old. Um, so uh, the team leader must be uh, at least 18 years old, but it doesn't have a limit of age. Uh, there should be um, there should be at least two organizations from two different countries, and uh, the project has to take place in one of the organizations' country. So this is for use exchange. Let's talk about also training courses because they are quite similar but also very different in the same times. Uh, it's uh, the training course is an activity which aims is to develop the competences, professional skills of people working with the youth. So the criteria criteria are basically quite the same, except it can be from two days to two months, and uh, travel days included. There is no limit of age, no team leader, so it sh people should be minimum 18 years old, but I have seen projects with people being 40, 30, 20 and mixed together. Uh, the group of this training course should be between 2 and 50 participants. So this is the two kind of activities that we see the most oftenly uh, because uh, they are heavily funded. With, what I mean is that they are heavily funded because there are many of them, but each one of them is not so much funded. And um, these projects are funded on different levels. First of all, there is a transport. So participants are reimbursed from the transport according to a threshold. So it's, this threshold is about the distance between the project location and the location of the organiz organization sending the participants. So for example, if I'm in France and people are from Lithuania, they can get up to 360 euros of transport reimbursement from home to the project location round trip. Uh, the, uh, the accommodation and the meals, also the pedagogical uh, materials, the trainer's salary, the facilitator's salary are in, under the, the organization, sorry, organizational budget. Uh, for use exchange, it's, uh, it's about 37 euros in France. It's according to the cost of life in the country, but in France it's 37 euros per day per participant. And uh, for training course, it's 66 euros per day per participant. Uh, moreover, you can also ask for uh, special funding, additional special funding, if you have, uh, for example, people disabled on your project or if you need translators or, uh, or language classes to prepare your participants, it's definitely possible to ask for extra funding. Uh, so I talked about the European Voluntary Service, actually it was a mistake because it doesn't exist anymore when I make this video, it's named European Corps of Solidarity. So it's uh, basically the same kind of program. There was some change, but in the way it's working is the same. If you're interested by this kind of program, it's more like individual mobility. And, uh, and uh, it's about volunteering in an organization during, uh, usually it's long term, but it can be also not so long, like two weeks. But I invite you to make your own research about it. Maybe I will interview someone in a future video about it. 
Let's go to the serious business, how to fill an Erasmus Plus application. Yeah, because if you want to organize a project, you should fill an application and you should explain why your project is really good and deserve to be funded. Uh, first of all, you need to choose a problematic, like it can be, for example, poverty in a rural area, it can be recycling, it can be the lack of knowledge about European policy, for example. First step is to check that this problematic is uh, matching with the priorities of uh, the European Union. You can find this kind of priorities on the European Union websites. And uh, then you need to learn a lot about this issue, this problematic, so you can uh, get out of it with uh, statistic data, uh, bibliographical uh, references and the uh, European uh, documents that are connected with this issue. So you can... Um, and any kind of information linked with the, with the issue. So it really shows that you took time to, to think about the problem, not only like from your experience, but also from uh, theoretical knowledge. Then you have to choose partners. Um, it's important to show why you choose the, the partners, the context, how you, meet, you met them, uh, the, the connection between the work of this partner, like this association, what is the connection between its work and uh, the problematic, also maybe a connection between the country of this partner and the problematic, uh, and also what they can bring in terms of competencies, in terms of experience, in terms of how to do skills uh, to the project itself. Then uh, it's very important to explain why the project is answering uh, needs from your partners. Maybe they have a lack of experience in this and they need exchange to understand better the, the problematic and find new methods to fight the, the problematic. Uh, when the problematic is really ad identified, you need to, to find also uh, objectives so this big problematic should have uh, sub should be subdivided into objectives. This objective should be smart. Smart is a methodology to have to find and to identify uh, uh, relevant objectives. So it's a methodology. There is even a new methodology named smarter smarter objectives. Uh, also, it's important to explain. Uh, that you are going to allow young people from disadvantaged background to participate in this project. So this disadvantaged background can be disabled, disabled people, uh, people discriminated because of their religious or cultural background. Uh, it can be young people from rural area, like far away from all kind of opportunities that you can find in urban areas. Or it can be even like young people with a refugee status. Um, you should really show that you're going to encourage them to participate in this project and you're going to find them and make them interested. You have also to explain very well um, how you're going to assist your partner and communicate with them to, to solve logistical issues like how to get to the project location with transport or how the participants are going to be accommodated or the infrastructures that will allow the project to take place under the best circumstances. Uh, it's also very important to indicate the safety measure, like where is the closest hospital, uh, the visa procedure, if you invite people who need visa. Also the mentoring, how each, in, each partner is going to mentor its participants. And uh, the way you're going to communicate with your partner can be like you explained that you, uh, you will have a Skype meeting every week, uh, every Friday evening, and you will talk about this kind of issues, then you will talk about this kind of issues on the next one. Uh, everything should be really well detailed, if possible. A part of the application is uh, dedicated to the management and quality criteria. So you will be, you will be invited to explain uh, what you're going to do to make sure this project is amazing and awesome and leave great memories to the participants and how you're going to make it different but in a better way. Uh, so you will explain like what you're going to set up 
to make it a pure success. You have also to explain how you're going to prepare the participants to this intercultural meeting because maybe some participants never met foreigner people before or they are not used to speak in English with, uh, with other people. So you will need to prepare them uh, before the, the activity takes place, before the mobility. And uh, you will also need to use a learning recognition tool and instruments during this project. It's very, very advised. So you definitely need to, to use this kind of element. So you, you will have to explain also in the application form how you're going to use them, how you're going to make them interesting for the participants to auto-evaluate themselves. So for example, with the auto-evaluation certificate named USPASS, which is very common during this kind of project. So it's definitely uh, a must if you want to organize a project to have the USPASS in the, in the application form. Uh, later, you will have to detail the hoped impacts that the project will have on the participants, but not only on the participants, also on the local community, maybe on the national level, uh, this kind of stuff. So, so you will have to take time to, to really think the impact your project will have. Above this, um, you will need to also detail uh, the dissemination. It's named DEOR, it's dissemination um, uh, of the results of the project. So, for example, you want to contact the local press and have an article in the, in the news. You want to write a blog on the internet or you want to film the project to make a video on YouTube. These are uh, dissemination tools, dissemination methods that you can implement in your project and you need to write about it in the application form and really put a uh, emphasize a lot about it. It's very important. It's not really secondary, it's really primary. Um, also, after that, you need to create a schedule for your project. When I talk about schedule, it's not only about saying from 9 to 10, there will be uh, icebreaker. Then 10 to 11, there will be, um, I don't know, a workshop about poverty in rural area. It's not only this, of course, you need to give title to your activities, but also you need to explain each activity, its objective, how you're going to do it, how you're going to implement it, the means you will need, like if you need some kind of tools or materials. So you need to be really detailed for every activity. It's of course something you put in the schedule, but you can also basically copy paste it inside your uh, project application form as well. Uh, so. All of this, uh, there are also some other parts I didn't talk about because they are quite self-speaking. And uh, all, all of this, like the thinking process and the writing process should take a week of work, let's say 35 hours. You should end up with an application form of uh, 60 pages, including also the question, of course. I say 60 pages, but actually now it's also an online platform, so you cannot really uh, talk about pages, but basically it should be big. There is 5,000 characters maximum per paragraph per question. Uh, basically they should be filled. You shouldn't write something in 500 characters. It should be filled with 5,000. Um, okay, maybe some parts can be with 3,000, but most of them 5,000. Sometimes it will not even be enough and you will have to, to make compromises. Um, so after this week, you will have the big chance to click on the submit button. Be careful though, there, there are only three um, submission dates per year. It's usually in uh, February, April and October. You have to count two months and a half after submitting your project uh, before getting the results, if your project is selected or not. If your project is refused, you have perfectly the right to improve it even ask for feedbacks from the national agency on about why it was refused and submit it again. You can even submit it again the same, exactly the same. It's definitely possible. I hope this video was very useful for you and you understand better how Erasmus Plus is working on the youth non-formal education level. I hope it will also make you want to submit a project and to fight problematics and to make young people meet each other. And uh, we will see each other soon in another video about conflict areas. I hope you will like it as well. 
And if you have any questions, feel free to send me a message on, uh, on the OFCI page of, on Facebook or in the comments on YouTube below, right below. Thank you so much for your attention and bye-bye.